All right. Hello to my Facebook audience. Praise God. I'm glad to join you uh, again this Sunday with uh, the live prophetic word from God. I'm going to give the prophetic word first, then I'm going to explain it. So I'm going to prophesy first, and then we're going to do a little bit of prophetic teaching because there's a lot of scriptures involved. And I want to be sure you have a chance to write down the scriptures so you can look them up for yourself. All right? This prophetic word has to do with miracles. Has to do with miracles. So let me release the prophetic word. My children, my beloved, behold, says the Lord, I have opened unto you my hand, and I have invited you into the glory realm. In the glory realm, there is a new dimension of miracles. In the glory realm, there is a new dimension of power in me. So I want you to study what I did with Moses. Study the quail that fed a nation. Study the ten plagues of Egypt. Study the parting of the Red Sea. Study what I did with Elijah and Elisha, where the heavens were shut up and it didn't rain, where oil was multiplied to pay off debt where a dead womb was opened, where children could come out. Study when I walked on the water and gave Peter the power to walk on the water. And when I fed the 4,000, when I fed the 5,000 with a very small amount of food. And as you study my word concerning miracles, your faith will increase in the area of miracles and you begin to pull miracles out of me. Therefore, my people, I release unto you the spirit of faith to believe me for miracles the spirit of faith to believe me in a level and on a dimension that you've never believed me at before. I release unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of me, that you may understand that I am the God that invented reality. I invented atoms and molecules. I therefore can rearrange them to give you a miracle. And as these miracles begin to manifest in your life, be sure to give me Give me, give me all the glory, says the Spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. Amen. That was a blessed prophetic word, and the Lord gave me that word uh, last night, and I've been excited all day to release it. So, I want to explain what's going on in that word. Excuse me, and I want to give you those scripture references so you can look it up for yourself. Uh, we've been invited by God. Apostle Eckhart has been preaching about the glory realm for some time now. And the glory realm is where God begins to move in your life in the miraculous way. Many of the things that you read about in the scriptures, they happen once you get into God's glory, but they don't happen any other way. And they happen by faith. And like myself, you may have wondered when you were a child, how come you see some people in the Bible and they seem to have miracle after miracle. They seem to have this incredible relationship with God where God is doing these incredible things. Yet you don't see that in the life of everybody in the Bible. And you don't see it in the life of every Christian. Okay, I'll tell you how. The answer is because those things are found in the glory of God. And you have to get into the glory realm of God for that level of power to begin to manifest in your life. And... You have to believe it, okay? Because the Bible said when Jesus came to, I believe it was Nazareth, his hometown, he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. Okay, and that is found in Mark 6, 5, okay, in Matthew 13, 58. He couldn't do any mighty works in his hometown because of their unbelief. So it's not the power of God, it's not the glory of God that's the problem. Okay, because even if you get into the glory realm, you have to believe it. Okay, you have to believe that God is able to manifest his miracle power in your life. And you have to believe that God is willing to manifest his miracle power in your life. And that's normally what trips people up. They either don't believe that God is able or they don't believe that he is willing. So in that prophetic word the Holy Spirit just gave me, God is telling you that he's able. But why is God able? Because God is the one, all the way back in Genesis 1, that said, let there be. God said, let there be light. Confidence and humility, amen. God said, let there be light. God said, let the firmament exist and let the firmament part the waters from the waters above the firmament and the water below. 
God spoke to the sea when he wanted sea creatures. God spoke to the air when he wanted uh, uh, creatures that flew in the air. Okay, And when God spoke, wanted man, what did he do? He spoke to himself. He said, let us make man. Okay, So God is the one that literally creates reality. Everything that exists, both in the invisible and, the invisible and visible world, is because God created it. If God created things, if God made atoms and molecules coalesce and turn into things, then God has the power to rearrange them and give you a miracle. Okay? There were no parents for Adam and Eve. God carved their bodies on the ground out of clay and then whoosh, blew into them. And both Adam and Eve became living souls. See, because God is able, both in the spirit and in the natural, and things in the spiritual realm and things in the physical realm, in any realm, God creates reality. He can control atoms and molecules. He's able then to rearrange them into a miracle, like when the Lord walked on the water. Water is not a solid substance like earth or cement. How did the Lord walk on the water? Like when the Lord turned the water into wine, how did he do that? He changed the chemical composition of the water. That's how. Because God can control atoms and molecules. Now that's God's ability. Okay? But is God willing? Is God willing? And the answer to that question is, yes, he is. Where does it say that? In the Bible. That's in Romans 8, 32. He that did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things, or freely give us all things? That's Romans 8 and 32. Okay? You know what that means? That means that God loves us so much, Father loved us so much, that he gave us the son. He gave us Jesus. Okay? How in the world can you believe that a God that would allow his child to be sacrificed on your behalf would hold anything else back? If God loved you enough to open his hand and give you Jesus, then the Bible says clearly, how will he not also, along with Jesus, graciously or freely give us all things? Okay? So there you understand from the creation account that God is able because he creates atoms and molecules, he can rearrange them. And then you understand from the Romans account that God is willing. He already showed you that he loves you enough to give you his son. Why would he hold anything back? Okay? So to get in that level with God, you have to get into the glory realm where his miracle power is. Okay? But you must also believe it. It's not going to do you any good if you don't believe it. Do you know how we know that's true? Because the first generation of the children of Israel that came out of Egypt, remember, they saw the ten plagues of Egypt. They saw the water uh, parted and the Red Sea. They saw God do miracle after miracle. How did you get there? Okay, I'll deal with that. They saw, saw God do all that. Then they got to, edge of, to the edge of the promised land and wouldn't go in and take the promised land because they didn't believe God. They said there are giants in the land. They're bigger than us. We are as grasshoppers in their sight, and we can't do it. And they died in the wilderness because even after seeing all the miracles of God, they didn't believe when Jesus rebuked the wind and the water, and he said, peace be still. That famous you know, verse that we quote all the time when the Lord said, peace be still. People never finished that story because the Lord then turned to his disciples and rebuked them and said, where was your faith? In other words, the Lord was saying to them, you could have stopped this storm too if you had believed. And Elijah shut up the heavens. I'm going to show you that scripture in a minute. So in other words, the Lord was saying to his boys, you could have stopped that storm if you had believed. There's another instance where they brought a child to Peter and them and asked them to cast a demon out. And they couldn't cast him out. Jesus sitting right there. So then they went to the Lord and Peter said, why couldn't we cast him out? And the Lord said, because of your unbelief, Jesus is sitting right there and you still couldn't cast the demon out because you didn't believe it. Okay? So you must get into the glory realm of God, but you must also believe. Believe when you get there that God is able and God is willing. God is able 
to do miracles, and God is willing to do miracles for you. Now, the way you get in the glory realm of God is through worship. Through worship. You spend time in his presence and you magnify him and you extol his name. You praise his name. You give him thanksgiving for all that he's done. Thanksgiving is when you thank God for what he's done. Praise is when you praise God for who he is. And you spend time in his presence, inviting him in the room through worship and praise, through counting your blessings before the Lord's throne, through magnifying him and glorifying him, through listing his attributes, all the things that God is and all the things that he is to you, through making a joyful noise, through praying in tongues, the various forms of worship, letting the minstrels play, letting the psalmist write new songs, letting the singer sing. That's how you get into the glory realm of God. You praise him, give him thanksgiving, magnify him, and you stay there. You praise him until you create an atmosphere that brings his glory in the room. That's what anointed worship is about. That's what anointed worship is designed to do. Bring the glory of God in the room. Okay? Uh, minister, because of the glory cloud. And I want to show you where that is in the Bible. That is in 2 Chronicles 5. Okay? 2 Chronicles 5, 13. Uh, they were in unison when the trumpeters and the singers were to make themselves heard with one voice to praise and to glorify. There it is, the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, and when they praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good, for his loving kindness is, is everlasting. Then the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. That is Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13 and 14. So somebody asked me on Periscope, how do you get into the glory realm of God? That's how. Okay, Second Chronicles chapter five, chapter five, verses thirteen and fourteen. They got on one accord. They had trumpeters and singers. They had musicians and vocalists make themselves heard with one voice. There's one accord again to praise and glorify the Lord. What does that mean? That means to talk about all the good things that God has done. That's praise. Uh, excuse me. That's thanksgiving when you think about all the stuff that God has done, and praise is when you talk about how good God is. Praise and glorify the Lord, and when they lifted up their voice, accompanied by trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music, when they praised the Lord, saying, He indeed is good, there it is, you're talking about His goodness, for His loving kindness is everlasting, that then the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud. And so many churches don't understand why they don't see a manifestation of God's glory every week. Some churches are at a level where, like, you know, some weeks, oh, the choir is saying good today, or the worship team is saying, saying good today. And some weeks, it's kind of dead, it's kind of flat, nothing happens. It's not supposed to be that way. You're supposed to enter into the glory of God every time you come into the house of God. You have to follow the principles that God lays out in Second Chronicles 5, 13, and 14. You have to get on one accord. You've got to have musicians. You've got to have vocalists. You've got to lift up your voice in one accord to praise and to glorify the Lord. You've got to talk about His goodness. You got to talk about how good he is and the good things he's done for you. Uh, trumpet, cymbals, instruments of music, when they praise the Lord, saying, He indeed is good. That means extolling his virtues, going over how and why God is so good, and his mercy is everlasting, his loving kindness is everlasting. Then the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. So not only is God's glory supposed to show up, it's supposed to show up so thick that you can't even hardly minister. It's supposed to show up tangibly. Amen. God bless you. It's supposed to show up tangibly in the room when you do that, when you do everything's in the scripture. You get on one accord, you got instruments, you got vocalists. You, again, it's the unity part, the unity, and you're talking about the goodness of God, his characteristics, his, his behavior. And you count your blessings. Say, he indeed is good. And his mercy endures forever. Or his love and kindness is everlasting. Then the glory comes. That's why when you are full of grumbling and complaining, there's no glory in your life as a Christian. That's why. 
There's no glory in your life as a Christian if you are always full of grumbling and complaining. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that people that grumble and complain and are never grateful to God, never get a breakthrough, they never get an increase, they never move forward? Hey, Sister Pat on Facebook Live, they never get an increase, they never move forward. When they're full of grumbling and complaining, do you know why? Because God does not want to hear us grumble and complain. God wants to hear us talk about his goodness and the good things that he has done. Because wherever you are, God has blessed you. And the way you get to the next level of blessing with God is you thank him for the level that you're on. Okay? If you got $100 and you want $1,000, you've got to thank God for that $100 first. You don't grumble and complain. You're not going to grumble and complain your way into a thousand. It doesn't work that way. So you have got to glorify the Lord. You've got to count your blessings. You've got to talk about all the, the ways that God is good. And you've got to do that with music. And you've got to do that with singing. You've got to do that with instruments and cymbals. And you have to be on one accord. You have to be in unity. You can't have people that are just playing at the same time. That's simultaneous playing. And that is not unity. Sometimes minstrels get up there and everybody's kind of doing their own thing. You're not on one accord. That's not unity. Sometimes people are singing all over the place. People are singing their own thing. That's not unison. That's not one accord. So the Bible gives you the principle, 2 Chronicles 5, 13 and 14, about how to manifest the glory of God in his house. And you're supposed to be in the glory of God every time you go to church and you go into worship. It's not supposed to be an up and down thing, an occasional thing. Uh, you know, the worship team sang really good today, or they sang that song I like. It's not supposed to be that way. Every time you come to God's house, you're supposed to come into his glory. He gives you the principles, okay? And like I said at the beginning of the broadcast, you have to understand and you have to believe that God is able to give you a miracle, but God is willing to give you a miracle. You see that? Because even coming into his house and even coming into the glory and even beholding other miracles is not going to do you any good if you don't believe it. You must believe it for yourself. You must believe. That's the difference between Christians. That's why some Christians get breakthroughs and some Christians don't. It's not that God hasn't made himself available. It's that some Christians do what the Lord said do and some Christians don't. Just like if you have more than one child, okay? If you've got three, four, five, six kids, some of your kids do exactly what you tell them to do. They say, yes, sir, yes, dad, yes, mama, yes, ma'am. Some of your kids turn up their nose and get disrespectful and disobedient and say, I ain't going to do none of what you say. Which one of them kids is going to get the blessing? All of them are your kids, aren't they? Okay? But the kids that do what you said to do, the kids that walk in obedience, are the ones that get blessed, okay? It's no different in the kingdom of God, okay? God has opened his hand and made his grace, his word, his glory available to us. But if you want to get the blessing, then you got to do what the Lord says do. You got to come into his house and praise him the way he says praise him and bring the glory into the house of God. Then when you get into the glory realm, you must use your faith and believe that God is able to do a miracle, and God is willing to do a miracle for you. Okay? Now, I want to give you all those scriptures and the miracles that I mentioned, because in the prophetic word that I shared at the beginning of the broadcast, there uh, the Holy Spirit uh, touched on a lot of different miracles that happened in the Bible. Well, I want to give you the scriptures to where they happened so you can begin to study them and meditate on the miracles in the Bible. And once you begin to meditate on the miracles in the Bible for yourself, your faith will begin to increase and your faith will begin to grow in the miracle realm. Now, the place where God parted the Red Sea for the children of Israel to walk across in dry land is Exodus chapter 14. Exodus, that's the second book in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter 14. And when you read the account, you will discover it didn't quite happen like it did in the movie, The Ten Commandments. I love The Ten Commandments. It was just on Easter weekend. I watch it every year. I love The Ten Commandments, okay? But in the, the movie, it happened like in five minutes. That water parted and it was across. That's not actually the way it happened in the scriptures. In the scripture, you'll see that the Bible says the wind blew all night. So they was out there all night, okay? So Exodus chapter 14 is where they crossed the Red Sea. 
where the Lord sent manna and quail to feed the children of Israel is Exodus chapter 16. That's where we're, hey, God bless you. I'm fine, thank you. That's where God sent manna and God sent quail to feed a nation, okay? Half a million, some estimates say a million, some estimates say two million people in the wilderness. God sent enough bread and meat to feed those people. That's Exodus chapter 16, okay? If you want to know where the plagues of Egypt are, the ten plagues of Egypt that God rained down upon Egypt to make Pharaoh let uh, the Israelites go, that starts, well, let me list the ten plagues. Uh, water into blood, frogs, lice, mixture of wild animals or flies, diseased livestock, boils, thunderstorm of hail and fire, locusts, darkness for three days, and the death of the firstborn. Those are the ten plagues, okay? They start in Exodus chapter 7, verse 14, and that concludes around... Exodus chapter 12, verse 36. Okay? That's the ten plagues of Egypt where God rained down his mighty power through plagues to deliver Israel from Egypt. Exodus chapter 7, verse 14, all the way through Exodus chapter 12, verse 36. Okay? That's where you find the ten plagues of Egypt. Water into blood, frogs, lice, mixture of wild animals or flies, diseased livestock, boils, Thunderstorm of hail and fire, locusts, darkness for three days, and death of the firstborn. Okay? Now, uh, God made, uh, they, Elisha was out there chopping down a tree with some of the sons of prophets, and the axe head came off, and it was iron. So normally it would sink to the bottom of the pond or the lake. Elisha made the axe head float. It made it float back up to the top. That's in 2 Kings chapter 6 verses 1 through 7, okay? 2 Kings uh, chapter 6, verses 1, 1 through 7, that's where the axe head floats for the prophet Elisha. The prophet Elijah caused a drought, and that's in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. He says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Okay? You see that? Elijah shut up heaven for years at his word. Okay? That's 1 Kings 17.1. Okay? Let's go to the miracle of how Elisha had a woman have many, many barrels of oil. And that oil multiplied until uh, she filled all the barrels that she had. And then Elisha told her, to go sell that oil and pay her debt. That's actually in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, where uh, Elisha told the widow to get all the barrels, all the containers she could get, and that the oil would keep flowing, okay? And then once she filled up all the barrels, then he told her to go sell that oil and pay her debt. Okay, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Now, the Shunammite woman, the Shunammite woman didn't have a child, and she was uh, merciful to uh, Elisha, and she gave him a place to stay. So Elisha said, well, what shall I do for her? And then he found out that she didn't have a child, so he wanted to be sure that she could have a baby. So he spoke to her barren womb, and God honored that, and they had a child. That is 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 17. Again, 2 Kings, chapter 4, verses 8 through 17. A woman that had been barren up to that point was enabled by the prophet to have a child. Okay? Now, where did Jesus walk on the water? That's in Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. That's when the Lord walked on the water. That's also when Peter stepped out of the boat and walked on the water to get to the Lord. So there you see, it wasn't just the Lord that walked on the water. Peter walked on the water too. Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. Where did the Lord feed 4,000 people? Now, the feeding of the 4,000 and the feeding of the 5,000 are two separate miracles. I think sometimes we confuse them. 
but they're actually two separate miracles. So, Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 39, is where Jesus fed 4,000 people. That's where they had seven loaves and a few small fish. Matthew 15, 29 through 39, that's when he fed the 4,000. Okay? In Matthew uh, 14, uh, Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21, that's when Jesus fed the 5,000. And that was when he had five loaves of bread and two fish. So you see it's a different quantity, still small amounts of food, but a different quantity to begin with. That's when the Lord did that miracle with food. You see that? So per the prophetic word that we receive by the Holy Spirit, God wants us to begin to study the miracles in Scripture. Okay? And as you begin to study them, your faith will increase. And as you enter into the glory realm where the miracle dimension is, the glory is the power of God. When you enter into that realm and you believe that God is able and you believe that he is willing to do it for you, then you will see the miracle power begin to manifest in your life. Again, that's the difference between Christians. That's why some Christians get that breakthrough and some Christians don't. Okay? Because they refuse to live and get in God's glory and they refuse to believe, believe that God is able and believe that God is willing. Okay? And there's one more thing I want to throw in here, and then we'll be ready to pray and close out. There's this concept that has unfortunately permeated so much of our Protestant experiences. I don't know if the Catholics have it too, but I've never been Catholic, but I've been a Protestant all my life. And there's this, 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 this phenomenon, this concept that I called genie concept. It's the genie concept of God. And what that's about is you think all you have to do is rub God like a magic lamp and then he's just going to do all the work and it's just going to be, be like magic and things are just going to happen. And if it doesn't happen that way, people get all mad and they fall out with God and they say all that Christianity stuff ain't real. You're, you're, you're just a bunch of crazy people. Stuff like that. Blessings to you too. Stuff like that doesn't happen. It's not real. And that's because, oh, first time viewer, God bless you. Great to have you here. And they say stuff like that doesn't happen, and that's just not the truth. Unfortunately, what you were taught is genie concept. Genie concept is where they teach you that everything is always up to God, and we as believers don't have any part in it. That is not the truth. 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 God will always do the God things, the God part, and you have to do the human things, the believer part, the things that we're supposed to do. When a woman got healed from the issue of blood, she said, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. When you study that in the Greek, you will discover that the verb tense there says she said it over and over and over again. She confessed over and over and over and over again. Remember, this woman has already spent all of her money and gone to all the doctors and they couldn't help her. When she heard about Jesus, she said over and over and over, she charged her spirit with faith. She confessed. Those are spiritual principles. She did something. She did her part. Then she pulled that miracle out of Jesus because the Lord wasn't even looking at her. She pulled that miracle out of God because she did her part. She believed the Lord supplied the power. The Lord supplied the opportunity. She supplied the faith. Well, I mean, you know, the measure of faith God gives us, but she acted on her faith and she supplied the works, meaning she got up and she did something. That's how she got the miracle. All them people that are saying the miracles of God ain't true, they're not doing anything. Okay? I've been healed. I, t I gave you my testimony. I got healed of angina when I was 25 years old. My heart started to close up and my blood vessels started to close up. And the doctor said I could have a heart attack and drop dead any time. I went to the prophet that raised me, Reverend Peyton B. Harrison Sr. He laid hands on me and prayed on me. And then I went to get my medicine and the Holy Ghost said, you don't have to take that medicine. Just believe. So I believed and I felt the power of God explode out of my heart. And I'm still here. Why? Because I did something. I went to the man of God. I received healing from God. And then the Holy Spirit said, I didn't even have to get my medicine. I just had to believe. Okay? All the people that are saying that God doesn't do miracles today, that's just in Bible times, blah, 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 blah. They ain't doing nothing. They're not getting in the glory. They're not getting in the word. They're not believing. And they're not adding any works to their faith. That's why you don't have no miracle. I've seen people let their kids die. 
I've seen people where I tried to minister to them to tell them God can heal your child, and they said no. They said, David, if that's what you believe, you have that, and their child died. That is not God. Okay? You refuse to get in his glory. You refuse to get in his word. <clears throat> you refuse to uh, praise him and glorify him like he told you to. You refuse to believe that he's able to do a miracle, and you refuse to believe that he's willing to do a miracle for you. Okay? Uh, so it's genie concept that's messing you up. It's genie concept. The thing you've been taught as a Protestant Christian that everything is all up to God and you don't have to do anything. That is not the truth. You have to do what the Lord says do. you got to do it the way the Lord says do it and God will do the God parts. God will supply the power. God will open the door. God will supply the opportunity. God will show up in his presence. But you have to do the things that we have to do. We have to operate in faith. We have to confess his word, not confess our fears, not grumble, not confess unbelief, but confess his word. We have to say his word. We have to charge our spirit with faith by saying his word. We have to charge our spirit by speaking in tongues. That's how you get in the spirit to be sure you're not in the flesh. And you have to add some works to your faith. Okay? You got to do something. You can't walk up to the ground and say, give me some tomatoes. The ground don't work that way. The ground just going to smile at you and say, don't bring me your need. Bring me some seed. From South Africa. Hey, hey, God bless you. Uh, Paco here from South Africa. God bless you. Thanks for uh, joining us today. So the ground is just going to smile at you and say, don't bring me your need. Bring me some seed. You can't yell at the ground. You can go in your backyard. You can go to a garden. You can go anywhere where there's dirt or earth. You can't stand there and yell at it and say, give me some tomatoes. You're going to be out there until you die. The ground is going to say, don't bring me your need. Bring me some seed. You got to do something. You got to add some works to your faith. So I wanted to touch on that. I'm going to do a more extensive teaching on that because this genie concept thing has really messed a lot of people up. A lot of people have let their children die because they don't understand God can work miraculously. God can work through doctors. God can work through medicine. You can have spontaneous divine healing. You can have healing from other ways. God can work through you changing your diet and exercise program. Okay? There are many different ways for God to heal you, but you've got to do your part. Okay? And that idea of genie concept, the idea that it's all up to God and that we don't have to do anything is incorrect. That is not scriptural. There's nobody in the Bible that got a miracle and didn't do anything. <laughs> the Bible says that Abraham believed God. Abraham and Sarah both had to let go of their efforts to try to make a baby in their own strength. And they had to believe. And then Abraham proved that he believed God through the resurrection of the dead because Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. Because Abraham believed that if God said, Isaac, through Isaac shall my seed be called, that God is able to raise my boy from the dead. Abraham really believed that. Okay? So this genie concept thing, these signs of father, those who believe, that's right. So this genie concept thing has messed up a lot of Christians, a lot of us Protestants. So I'm going to do some more teaching on that in the future so that we understand that God will do the God things. He will supply the, pro the power. His presence will come in the room. He will open the door. He will give you the opportunity. He will give you a measure of faith. He'll do the things that God can do. But then you've got to do the human part, the believer part. You've got to speak the word. You've got to believe the word. Confess the word. Charge your spirit. Okay? You've got to stay in prayer. You've got to put some works behind your faith. You've got to do your part. Then, then you get the manifestation. Then you get the miracle. Then you get the harvest. Okay? So there's a lot more to unpack there. I know there's a lot more to say there because people are always trying to badmouth Christ, always trying to badmouth Christians, always trying to badmouth God, always trying to badmouth the Bible and say that it's not real and that's not true. What is true is that if you want to walk in the miracle realm, 
you've got to do what God says do, which is get in his glory, believe that he is able, and believe that he's willing to do it for you. Okay? All right, well, God bless you. This was a blessed word today. I'm always blessed when the Spirit of God gives me a prophetic word, and I'm glad to, to share the word of God with you through the prophetic word, through uh, teaching, through exegeting the scripture, through giving you scripture references so you can look up and uh, study the word of God for yourself so you can increase your own faith because nothing in your life is going to happen apart from your faith. How do I know that's true? Because the Lord himself said, according to your faith, so it is unto you. Okay? That is in Mark chapter 11. I want to give you that exact verse. Uh, no, I'm sorry. The one in Mark is about, uh, you have what you say. The one, uh, there's a point in Matthew 9, 29, where this Lord said, according to your faith, will it be done unto you? That's when he opened blinded eyes. But let me uh, find, so it is unto you. Okay. Uh, 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 uh. Yep. Mm. That's all in Matthew. Okay. Uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is a confidence of what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him or that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Uh, Isaiah 40.31, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. OK, I want you to notice that in every one of those cases, we have to do something. We have to believe we have to wait on the Lord. We have to do something that doesn't just happen by magic. So, again, like I said, I'm going to do a more extensive teaching on that because I want to show you uh, all throughout the scriptures where when people got something from God that um, they did something. That's what I'm trying to look for. Yeah, that's Mark 11, 22, where the Lord says, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says that it's mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Right. That's Mark, uh, Mark 11, 22 and 23. That's what I was talking about. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to teach on that some more because uh, we're out of time now. OK, uh, I want to experience his glory and be baptized by the Holy Spirit and fire. Amen. God bless you, uh, Sister Mary. Uh, yes. Uh, being baptized with the Holy Spirit in fire has to do with coming into his presence and uh, glorifying him and praising him and bring his presence into the room and you will feel his glory manifest. Now, being filled with the Holy Spirit can happen through the laying on of hands. But also, if you want to get filled with the Spirit, you also need some deliverance. You need to be sure that whatever is in you that's not of God comes out so that the Holy Ghost can come in and clean and purge that vessel so the Holy Spirit can dwell. So again, these are very extensive teachings. These are not things I can do in a few minutes. So keep tuning in every week. I come on every Sunday at 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm going to do some continued teaching and prophesying about genie concept because we want to get away from the genie concept of God that has taught us uh, erroneously that it's all up to God and we don't have to do anything. That's not true. So I'm going to revisit that in the weeks to come. All right? So I'm going to pray a closing prayer. Thank you all so much for tuning in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you thanking you that your word is wonderful. Your word is life. Thanking you, Father, for giving Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life. Thank you, Jesus, for sending the Holy Spirit. And thank you, precious indwelling Holy Spirit, for giving us your presence, for giving us comfort, guidance, for giving us light for guiding us into all truth, for giving us conviction, for showing us what righteousness is, for all the things that you do for us, Holy Spirit, and bearing witness in our spirit that we are the children of God. We give you glory. Great is the Father. Great is the Son. Great is the Holy Ghost, three in one. We just extol you. We magnify you. We glorify you. We thank you for being able to get uh, enter into the glory realm through getting on one accord and exalting your name and glorifying your name. For you truly are a good God. 
and your mercy endures forever. And we're not going to grumble, and we're not going to complain, and we're not going to be negative, and we're not going to count our problems. We're going to count our blessings that you may be pleased with what you hear and manifest your glory. And then we're going to believe you. We're going to believe, Father, that you loved us enough to give us Jesus. And Jesus loved us enough to shed his blood and give us his life. And the Holy Spirit loved us enough to come down here and indwell us. We believe that you are able to give us a miracle and you are willing to give us a miracle. And we're going to see the manifestation of your power in our lives as we stir up our faith and begin to do our part. So we thank you for it, God. We thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you are a God that wants us to succeed, that shows us how to succeed if we just believe and obey. If we just do what you say, we'll get the blessing. So we thank you for it. We thank you for this opportunity. And let all of us that are believing and walking in obedience begin to see the miracle manifestation of your power to glorify your name and your name only. It's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for tuning in. Out of time for this week, but I'll be here next Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And again, we're going to do some more teaching on Gene Concept and also release whatever prophetic words the Holy Ghost have, uh, has to say. Thank you so much. God bless you. Have a good week. Begin to study your scriptures. Stir up your faith concerning miracles. Get in God's glory and watch those miracles begin to manifest. God bless you. I'll talk to you next time.